The first question is, I guess, you know, as what is, as they say in the world of the uh, superhero movies, what is the origin story of this particular book? How did it come to pass? Well, first of all, Joshua, I would like to say that uh, it's mutually, mutually uh, a great honor to be sitting here with you. Um, uh, Joshua just reminded me that come January, he will have been uh, writing for the San Francisco uh, Chronicle for 32 years, and in this day and age, that is that is amazing. So congratulations for that. <laughs> the um, the origins of the book, as uh, we were uh, lightly discussing yesterday, were unusual because I, even though I'm often asked to write, um, uh, the purpose is limited. Usually, I write the introduction to a season brochure or something and welcome the various subscribers to the season or I've become quite skillful at writing grant applications so there's uh, um, the <laughs> but I do draw upon the fact that words are very very special if you can use them well and they are one of the primary sources of communication that we have um, the actual genesis of this book came from a number of speeches that I was giving to defend my orchestra and defend my opera house in Munich, Bavaria. Uh, at that particular time, uh, there was uh, a proposed wave of budget cuts which were meant to go through and uh, quite oppositely, I was arguing for a, a budget increase, not a budget cut. And um, what alarmed me the most was a kind of um, uh, a redefining of what reality was. I mean, in this day, I guess that's, we've, we've become used to it, but in five years ago, it was sort of a new concept. Um, the suggestion was through many, many speeches that I had heard given through uh, political leaders, uh, this goes across borders, not only in Germany, was that somehow classical music was not really deserving of uh, support from either the state or from um, any sort of philanthropical organizations because it was only pertinent to a small section of society and that society, it was implied, was an elite part of the society, perhaps uh, a segment that had access to, uh, to um, education or a higher lifestyle or more leisure time. Uh, this of course, has nothing to do with the genesis of, of what we today call classical music, the Age of Enlightenment from, say, the late 1700s through up until um, the early 21st century. We might call that the, the genesis of our great, great repertoire, which now continues through the 20th century until today. That Age of Enlightenment uh, was where this idea of the symphony was formed, the idea of symphonies was formed, expressions of those ideals of the Age of Enlightenment or the ideals of the revolutions that were taking place at the time, uh, equality, uh, brotherhood, and freedom, uh, these great ideals of the French Revolution. It is out of this cradle that the whole society developed such that uh, people turned to classical music for, um, for help, for assistance, uh, for support. Um, that has nothing to do with the elite segment of the society. Uh, at that time, at the time of Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Bach, there were many closed societies, um, the aristocracy, um, the, the court, um, the church. These were societies that were generally closed to the open uh, public. And the art that the court, the art that the aristoc aristocracy and the church created uh, is a part of our um, uh, repertoire today. But it wasn't easily accessible uh, by the general public. And what was so wild and, and uh, radical about these great Haydn performances in London, or the subscription concerts of, of Mozart in his later life, or the great subscription concerts of, of Beethoven, is that um, they were open to everyone. And the musicians played not in uh, 
court attire, but they played in uh, tails. Tails was the blue jeans of the day. Uh, <laughs> merchants um, had to work, so they cut away the, um, the frac, as it was called, so that they could lift heavy boxes, maybe ride a horse, um, tend to their customers. This work, working class uh, attire became the attire of the symphony orchestra. So this, uh, I mean, we, we sometimes forget that today. But uh, the whole basis uh, of where the idea of the symphonic arts came from was equality and freedom and brotherhood. That's a theme that somehow is relevant for every time that we live in, uh, no matter what society we are. Uh, oppression um, uh, in various forms do exist, and we need to have something like classical music that rises above to help us never forget that freedom and equality are really the basis of humanity. Um, so, um, when I heard this through various politicians, I, I really saw a red flag, and uh, that became the basis of a series of, of speeches that I gave very, very much defending the role of the opera, defending the role of, of the Philharmonic Orchestra. And uh, a publisher happened to be in the house in one of these speeches, and he said, yes, uh, Mr. Nagano, you should really write this down and put it in a book, and if you do, I will publish it. And that was how the book came to be. Ah, thank you. So as a result of that, one of the great themes I see running through this entire book, and you've just alluded to it, is this sort of anxiety or, or concern about what the place of classical music and indeed the high arts in general, the fine arts in general, are going to be in a modern society. And there are pages in this book in which you're sort of full of, of um, uh, gloom and pessimism about it, or, or concern, let's say, and other pages where you're uh, quite uh, exultant about the importance of, of, of music, and they, they kind of go back and forth, and I, I feel the mood shifting as I go through it. One of the things you mention is a quote from, from Schiller uh, saying that art has always been compelled to defi defend itself against the idol of utility. So this notion that art has to uh, uh, justify its place in society is not a new one. It's not postmodern, it's not 20th century, it goes all the way back. So how do you balance those, those two strains in your own thinking of sort of... Um... I think uh, the gloominess <laughs> or the pessimism, uh, it, it doesn't have so much to do with that I was sort of in a bad mood that day. <laughs> uh, I think it's more tied to what aspects of classical music we're speaking of. Um, as I often tell my programming staff, if there, if there is somehow a, a problem selling Beethoven, it is not Beethoven's fault. Uh, that's just we can take that as a as a as a fundamental given. The looking around uh, now, um, almost 2020, I would say it's a time to be very optimistic. There are so many great and visionary composers writing today that I would have never have imagined uh, would be there. I bear in mind that my own education and development took place towards the end of the 20th century. And at that time, uh, naturally, we all thought the avant-garde was the avant-garde. And when it was over, then we'd go somehow in a different direction back to neoclassic. Uh, but th this young generation of composers is, um, is brilliant. And it's supported with an equally brilliant of fantastic performers, very, very young performers, uh, gifted, uh, technically free. Uh, they are not no longer bound by the limitations that uh, our generation was bound by. Um, so spontaneous and so um, 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 charismatic. On the side of performing classical music and the classical music's future in terms of having the repertoire go on, it is a time that I honestly feel uh, we can be very, very optimistic. Speaking about the institutions, however, that are given the responsibility to 
carry classical music forward and to make it accessible to a general public. Um, I'm not sure if these institutions will continue in the form that they are today, or they have been, say, in the post-war years. I'm not sure if they'll continue without um, a radical adaptation to our, our times. Um, and maybe some of, the, some of the darker moments come uh, out of uh, the perspective that uh, we oftentimes, uh, in our heavy responsibilities and our duties to fulfill our, uh, yeah, our responsibility or, or expectations, we can sometimes forget uh, what the core is uh, that really excites and motivates um, the next generation. Um, I remember my own parents would seem to forget that pretty often when I was young. Um, the, 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 um, there are some basic, even though there are many, many uh, uh, sort of triggers which, which motivate or inspire the next generation, there are some constants, and that would be no compromise. I hated it when my father said, yes, well, Kent, you know, we're just going to have to compromise here. You can't have what you want, and however, you may just get enough that you'll be satisfied somewhere we need to fit, find a middle ground. I, I, I really hated compromise. The other was um, mediocre quality. Um, if you offer a child the choice between the very best quality, superior quality if possible, or some sort of make-do thing, normally speaking, the child without any sort of formal education will choose that which is of a, of a higher quality. Uh, another given is basically whatever status quo is, the next generation doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And I, I until this day, have a physical reaction when someone says, well, that's the way it has always been done. Because, of course, what that really means is not the way it's always been done, but it's been done that way as long as you can remember. <laughs> you know, right. that always and as long as you can remember are two different things. Status quo is... Um, is death to creativity. And naturally, when a, when a very young child is uh, limited by only choices within the status quo, uh, it will lead to, uh, at some point, a, a great revolution. And these aspects, as they begin to threaten programming or the way that an institution thinks, uh, it will signal that at a certain time, uh, these institu institutions will pass into um, irrelevance for the times. And it's a, it can be a very, very dangerous and sad phenomenon to see, to watch some something or some person or, or some phenomenon become that was very, very dear to you somehow become uh, oriented into a situation where it loses, clearly is losing its relevance. And I think that's something that we as performers need to constantly question uh, to make sure that we stay true to these um, fundamental uh, um, um, and intrinsic, intrinsic elements of, of what creativity really means and stands for. So through the book, I think the dialogue does shift. I speak through, I speak about institutions and uh, as most people here know, of course, I, I spend most of my creative time within very large and very heavy institutions. Um, so it's not that uh, this is something uh, uh, that uh, I'm suggesting that these institutions are, are somehow wrong or that they don't serve the public. No, not, not at all. On the other hand, they allow things that normally would not be possible. It's only if they lose... Um, the connection to the very purpose why they're existing that uh, you can become concerned. But, I mean, I would say, couldn't we connect those two things that you just mentioned, which is to say the extraordinary creativity and inventiveness and daring of this new generation of composers and performers and uh, the need for institutions like symphony orchestras, opera companies, to adapt and reorient themselves to that pole star of, you know, in other words, let the, let the creative voices guide 
guide the dialogue and, and the institutions react as necessary rather than the other way around. Absolutely, and, and that's why um, uh, many of us are engaged in, in, uh, in trying to make sure that these institutions have, the, have both the artistic substance and also the financial security so that they can really dare to go on into the future. Yeah. How is it going? <laughs> well, um, uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm permanently tied with two organizations, and um, they're doing very, very well. Uh, we are beyond sold out, uh, are beyond capacity performances, um, and financially, um, I, I don't want to say too much because it's bad luck, I think, but, <laughs> but for the moment, we both of these houses have colossal surpluses. Wow. So, um, but you know, these, I've been in Montreal for 16 years. It didn't uh -huh. happen overnight. Right. And the same thing for Hamburg. So I'm going to, since you mentioned uh, Montreal, I'm going to just jump ahead a bit, um, taking my, quest, my planned questions out of order a little bit. One of the things that fascinated me in your discussion of your time in Montreal, especially your early days in Montreal, was the, the sort of realization or the aha moment that one of the ways to bring the population there around was to con think about and talk about classical music through a lens that was flavored by the population's enthusiasm for sports and particularly ice hockey. And that that was sort of the civic, forgive me if I'm, <laughs> If I'm characterized, mischaracterized, we're, we're missing it. a few steps in there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you 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 describe how the 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 hockey analogy was a kind of a conceptual breakthrough for you in 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 your in your planning there. Have uh, I just invented this out of yeah, did, I, I, did I dream this? It sounds a pretty uh, foreign <laughs> to me, but. <laughs> But there, there, there are certain elements that, uh, yes, the ice, ice hockey uh, element is definitely there in Quebec. Okay. Um, no, the, um, the challenge, uh, uh, when I came to Quebec uh, two years before uh, I was meant to, to begin, um, it was a very funny conversation uh, because my French is acceptable, uh, but Quebec is very different, Quebecois is very different. And um, we were communicating, but sort of in, 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 in little starts and stops. Um, the administrative director was trying to explain to me that there was a big problem. Uh, there's a big problem because the orchestra had lost a large amount of its public through um, uh, a lot of uh, miscommunication during um, the separation of a very, very rich and successful era with Charles Letois and the orchestra going on into the future. And that separation was, um, was very noisy. And because of it, the orchestra lost a lot of its public and the public that it did have. Um, uh, my colleague was, was explaining that um, Yes, uh, every, every year uh, they don't come back. Less and less, uh, every year the numbers that come back are less. And I said, oh, well, that's, um, that's a problem. She said, yes, yes, it is a problem. I said, well, does it have to do with, with performance standards? Does it have to do with um, programming? And she said, no, no, they don't come back. And I said, yes, I understand that they don't come back. And she said, we have a lot of gray hair. And I said, yes, yes, I understand. We have a lot of gray hair. And she said, and they don't come back. <laughs> and, and, and so f f I finally said, I'm not really following you here. And she said, Mr. Nagano, they are dying. <laughs> so they were, we, we had an aging uh, subscription base and, and it wasn't being renewed at and every year, a couple of folks would pass away. So the numbers were going down, and that, that was my beginning. I felt that um, it was important to, um, to just carefully look at everything. And one of the things that we looked at was, um, was the, the fundamental uh, repertoire that was being programmed. And certain um, 
certain parts of the repertoire were played and, and you could say even overplayed because the same titles would come back year after year after year with great frequency. And other, um, other parts of the great repertoire uh, were strikingly absent. So, for example, Johann Sebastian Bach. There was very, very few records of performances, even the Passions had never been performed for 40 years. Um, Franz Josef Haydn was not really there. Beethoven was not really there. Besides the Fifth Symphony and the Ninth, few performances uh, were, were given. They could find no record of the First Symphony ever being done uh, in all of the in all of the archives. Uh, the Second Symphony was done 45 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, Schubert, uh, besides the great C major and the unfinished, was pretty much non-existent. So these funny, funny gaps. So we decided to address this, but since there was not really an audience for Beethoven, not really an audience for Mahler, for example. Uh, they were, uh, in the words of my colleagues, they were box office poison. Uh, Gustav Mahler, nobody wanted to hear Mahler. Uh, uh, if, you, um, if you were to perform uh, Strauss, it was kind of iffy. So the question was, again, if people don't come to a Beethoven concert, it's, it's not Beethoven's fault. Somehow, the way that is being performed, the level that is being performed, uh, the energy through which it's being performed, the integrity of how it's performed and how it's presented somehow is not offering a mirror so that when the audience comes they identify with it, they see themselves. So the, to come to your point of the, um, of the ice hockey, um, there were two concerts that season that, uh, that were very important to me. One was an all Beethoven concert, uh, and the other was to re-explore Ein Heldenleben, so a Strauss concert. Uh, so, how do you make Beethoven relevant for Quebec? Uh, Beethoven never visited Quebec, so you can't say that there was an anniversary year of when, when he came and gave a lecture at Montreal <laughs> University. Um, but what was interesting through just simply uh, reading and research was that the great expansion of Quebec took place during the Napoleonic Empire. And particularly Montreal had an enormous burst of growth right around the time of the expansion of the empire, which of course included the bombardment of Vienna. And the bombardment of Vienna at that time uh, affected very, very dramatically Beethoven. You could say that during the influence of the French Empire at that time, what was being heard in Paris and Vienna was being heard in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of bridge uh, uh, that we had. And the ideals of the French Revolution, which at least in the early years Napoleon was fighting for, before he declared himself emperor. Um, uh, somehow those ideals ring very, very true uh, in the province of Quebec. So the program we designed so that our public could see themselves in the mirror of the music was uh, all Beethoven, the overture to Egmont, followed by incidental music to Egmont, uh, intermission and the fifth symphony. And the focus was on uh, revolution. The Egmont story itself uh, is based on Goethe, of course, a very complex Goethe story, maybe at least for me, not the most successful Goethe story. But it paralleled very closely the incident in Rwanda, the genocide incident, uh, the United Nations forces, um, which you may remember, they were headed by someone from Quebec, someone from Montreal named General Romeo Delaire. Uh, Delaire still had a residence in Montreal. And following the Rwanda controversy, 
uh, genocide. It, it was greatly discussed in, uh, in international affairs because uh, General Dallaire needed to take decisions that were uh, unsanctioned by the leadership of the United Nations and, and very, very controversial for a military person to take these decisions, but he was trying to avert uh, what appeared to him was certain genocide. Um, it created a very, very difficult period for him and his career within the military. Um, and this was something uh, that the Montrealers followed very closely. The Egmont uh, story is something similar. Uh, religious beliefs uh, uh, taking a priority which became politicized and led to massive wars and heroism because of these wars. Uh, it was very easy to adapt that story to the travails of General Dallaire. And we asked General Dallaire to come and to share his story as a basis for uh, the thread that would link together the incidental music of, of uh, Egmont. And following the intermission, then of course, was Freedom, the, the Fifth Symphony. That was a turning point for our audiences um, because suddenly the music of Beethoven had a certain pertinence to their, their heritage, uh, their way of thinking, um, the way they have perceived they've been treated by the rest of the world, their history. Um, it was a very simple thing for us to do, but trying to do an all Beethoven program uh, under the illumination of a way that was sensitive to the anthropological past of Quebec. That was the point. The other concert was um, Ein Heldenleben, Strauss, of course, heavily influenced by Nietzsche. And I did discuss with my colleagues if I should give a lecture on Nietzsche. And they said, no, Mr. Nagano, no, Mr. Nagano, no you don't want to do that. No, one, no one's going to listen to you. And if they did, they won't understand what you're saying. And even if you speak French, they won't understand what you're saying. So I really wanted uh, our public to have a, a new perspective on Einheld and Leben. There was a new edition at the time. Um, and the orchestra had not played the, uh, the Einheld and Leben for many, many years. So right at that time, uh, one of the great hockey legends of the Canadian ice hockey team uh, was undergoing a public uh, um, uh, controversy. It was tragic because he was, um, he was a beloved figure and I idolized by every kid that went out onto the ice hockey. He wanted just to be like this great hero. And um, the problem was that he, uh, he had retired and retired in the greatest of glory, but uh, his son had a run-in with the law because of drug uh, abuse. And uh, there were some crimes that were done that were violent crimes. And the, the shadow that that cost, that that brought on this great legendary hockey player's personal life and his family was, uh, was a very heavy burden. Uh, he was being interviewed and asked to defend his son, and uh, it was all being played out in public. Um, very, very, uh, very emotional, and uh, it placed in everyone's mind the reality that being a sports hero is not all just fun. Mm. There are certain aspects that come with offering your life to the public. Uh, uh, that sometimes with intense scrutiny you're, you're, you're being uh, obliged to pay a price that maybe normal um, uh, people wouldn't have to pay. These themes, of course, are very strong within the Nietzsche philosophy be behind Ein Heldenleben. Of course, Ein Heldenleben is a complex piece because it also deals with Strauss and how he perceives himself personally with his wife, how he perceives his wife. Let's not forget that the main villains in Heldenleben are uh, the music critics. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, and that very interesting uh, relationship uh, between mm -hmm. uh, Strauss and his, his critics. Um, but anchored in, of course, a much, much deeper platform. Um, so 
as a parallel piece to um, Ein Heldenleben, I commissioned a work. And the work that I commissioned was from a well-known Quebec composer, uh, 21st century piece, brand new. And I asked, instead of having a traditional solos, would you please include spoken text instead? And I went to the Canadian ice hockey team and I asked them to assemble a list of all the living legends to whom I would assign uh, a speaking part of this piece. So the hockey organization supported this initiative really very enthusiastically because I'd explained that I'm just trying to bring a, a broader dialogue, a broader narrative to everything that's going on uh, with this difficult um, uh, period for the sports hero. And the sports hero, his colleagues did respond and every legendary uh, ice hockey player of the last 20 years agreed to come onto the stage. And they read their lines. It was, it was actually very moving because they took it so seriously and memorized these lines. And uh, it was a little bit, um, it reminded me of, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the song, We Are the World, uh, yeah. where a pop star would come in and sing two words and then sort of <laughs> disappear. It was, it was a little bit like that. But uh, the public, of course, they came uh, in throngs. We sold out the house many, many times over to see their great sports stars. And their reward was to hear Ein Heldenleben. <laughs> and they had nev most of them had never heard a classical music concert in their life. And the acute listening to the Strauss was unlike, it was a tension unlike we've never had before. And as you can imagine, uh, the, the piece is a great work. And the result of the audience, of course, was, was very enthusiastic for, for the uh, Don Pierre work for ice hockey players. Uh, but it was thunderous for Ein, Ein Heldenleben. On paper, it looks like oh, yeah, Nagano commissioned a, a new work uh, contemporary music together with a standard war horse, mm -hmm. Ein Heldenleben. But in reality, again, we try to have a, just a certain sensitivity to the, to the societal fabric that holds that community together so that, again, if the public were to come to one of our symphony concerts, they would identify with what they heard and identify with how we were playing these pieces, with whom we were playing these pieces. And this, the <laughs> so that's how the ice hockey that's element right. came. And uh, every, everyone remembers, funnily enough, the ice hockey piece, but everyone has forgotten Ein Held. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the way. So I want to I want to come to the beginning of your book, and uh, which begins with this very lovely and moving sort of memoir of your childhood in Morro Bay and what happened there to turn it into a, a little um, oasis of music. And um, for those who haven't read the book, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Wat, Wat Tung, Korshelli? Very good, yes. Okay, and uh, if you can tell them about what happened and then I'm gonna come back to you with a, with a follow-up question. Okay. Just for those who haven't, you know, who aren't familiar with the narrative. Uh, Mr. Korshelli or Professor Korshelli, um, came from Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, it's the same area, the same city where Joseph Stalin came from. And he was a son of the intendant of the Staatstheater or the Staatsoper. So the big, big theater, the big opera house in, in central Tbilisi. Mr. Korshali's father uh, was a very dynamic leader, and this, the house at that time was the center of everything that took place in Tbilisi. It was a it was a meeting point for the intellectual community of Tbilisi, and at the same time, a place that everyone else would gather just simply to share an experience. And uh, with the politics of Joseph Stalin becoming more and more controversial. Uh, this is during the 19, early 1930s, um, late 1920s. Mr. Korshali's father took to the stage to 
publicly question the wisdom mm. of the direction the Soviet Union was going. Um, and Mr. Korshali remembers meeting then Joseph Stalin, who came, set him on his knee, said really nice things to him, offered him a piece of candy, and then assassinated his father. Uh, and the mother, who survived, sent Corey Shelley and his brother out of Tbilisi. And it seemed that it would be possible for him to get an education in Munich. So he moved, uh, he moved to Munich and went into the conservatory, the Hochschule, and was proving to be an outstanding pianist, an outstanding performer. But unfortunately for Mr. Korshali, just as he was beginning to, his, his reputation was beginning to take root in Bavaria, um, a young politician whose name was Adolf Hitler was just beginning to rise uh, in popularity and, and uh, presence. And because of that, Korshali had to run for his life. And he lost his brother on the way. He, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a typical uh, refugee story. He found his way to the French coast, was able to get on a, on a boat to the United States, had a couple of sponsors who helped him uh, when he arrived, and when he arrived he was told, uh, forget about becoming a concert pianist. You gotta make a living. So, go get a teaching degree, spend a couple of years in school, get a teaching degree, and find out a way to survive. This is the United States. Everyone has to earn a living here. So Mr. Korshali, um, he did abandon his performing career, and he went to the place where education was free, the University of California. <laughs> and he received uh, his education and got his teaching degree. The first job that he was offered, he accepted. And that job was in a little dumpy fishing town called Morro Bay, California. <laughs> and he arrived uh, and discovered um, uh, pretty much of a t just a town like a village uh, where the children pretty much came from one of two segments of society. Either they were the children of farmers or they were the children of fishermen. A couple of the children were children of merchants, but overwhelmingly it was fishermen and, and cattle ranchers and farmers. Um, so he fought for funding and won funding to build a conservatory in Morro Bay, a real conservatory, uh, pianos, and he established two orchestras and three concert bands. And what I think is the most remarkable thing is he was able to convince the young children, myself included, that if you were cool, you could play a musical instrument. Mm. And if you were uncool, you could not. <laughs> so the pressure, the pressure was really there. And I, um, I had studied the piano, uh, and I became a private student, Mr. Korshali, but that's not a real instrument. I wanted to play in the orchestra. I wanted to play in, in the concert band. And so through him, uh, and in, not, in to, not one generation, but three generations, uh, three and a half generations of children, their children's children, their children's children's children, and then yet another generation after that, all came up under, through this conservatory, and the conservatory was pretty, was, it was tough. We, uh, classes at the elementary school would begin around nine o'clock, uh, so we had to be in the conservatory at seven, and work for two hours before going to classes, and then usually school let out two thirty, three o'clock, and we go back and have orchestra practice every day from three thirty until six o'clock. And this is every day, five days a week. And for those of us who showed a particular keen interest, uh, Mr. Korshali would open up his home studio during the weekends where we would have recitals, we'd play for each other, uh, study theory, study analysis, uh, European history, painting, 
um, the visual arts, of which he was also very, very active. What it offered me personally uh, was an option. At that time, um, popular culture was becoming very, very uh, uh, visible. Uh, it was through the 1950s, 1960s explosion of media uh, capacity, television, um, advertising became much more sophisticated than it ever had been in the past. And therefore, popular culture uh, was really being offered as, as the way uh, forward. Um, in my childhood, for example, it was the big surfing wave. I'm not sure if you remember uh, the Beach Boys or these, these folks. And it, it was very, very fashionable uh, if you could surf. And I, re I remember sitting in Mr. Corcelli's studio because through the window you could look down at the beach. Wave. He lived on a mountain and you could still see the beach. And I saw these really cool blonde-headed guys on the beach with beautiful partners and they were all surfing. And uh, I was playing the Mozart C major sonata and I was going, somehow this doesn't go together. Uh. Mozart C major sonata and uh, this image of, of surfing down on the beach. So I complained to Mr. Corshelli. I said, you know, everyone's having fun. And he said, you're not having fun? And I said, <laughs> I said well, uh, it's not the same as being on the beach and playing. And he said, well, you are playing. Uh, and he used that as, as an entryway into this very simple introductory uh, sonata. Um, the repertoire was standard, lit, uh, standard repertoire, Bach, Mozart. And he encouraged me to use the imagination that all children are given with. And the imagination triggered by that studio with the great paintings that we were surrounded, the great books, uh, the great private seminars that we as five, six, seven-year-old children had. Um, it allowed all of us who were his private students to, for those moments that we were in his studio, we could take a trip. I spent those hours in Vienna. Mm. I spent those hours in Paris, in Rome, in Milano in Berlin, in Bavaria, where, of course, Corricelli spent part of his life. And I saw the images and I played the music. And for those hours and hours and hours, I was not, no longer in Morro Bay. I, was, I had the great privilege of escaping the small town with all of its dynamics, which a small town, living in a small town is not all positive. I mean, right. gossip and sort of saying bad things about other people, that they could get very, very intense. And whatever you did, your neighbors were talking about it the next day. Somehow, for not only myself, but I would say this generation of children that grew up with him, through classical music as he taught it, which as I've mm. alluded to was very strict, very high, high discipline, quotient, um, concentration was required. We were given the option to leave Morro Bay. So, so I always thought you were a surfer kid, no? Did I make that up? Is that a misconception on my part? When I wasn't playing the piano, I was surfing. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, I, the, re, the reason I wanted to bring this up, it's a wonderful description that you give in the book. And honestly, Ken, it reads sort of like a fairy tale. It's, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a sprinkling of, of magic on top of it, where this description of Morro Bay turning into this, you know, uh, little Vienna by the, by the, by the Pacific and, and music in every home and, and all of this. And I thought, yes, it, I read this and I thought, yes, it's possible to bring classical music into the lives of the children of farmers and the children of fishermen. And I had this moment of great surging optimism and belief in it. And then I, then the little voice in my head said, yeah, but you need Corricelli. You need that one sort of magical, you know, magician type to, to make that happen. And it doesn't happen in the next town over. So did you feel and do you feel that there was something 
singular and miraculous about that particular experience that might not have been replicable elsewhere? Or conversely, is it the kind of thing that you know, could happen anywhere with just the right combination of factors? Most of us, um, we've throughout uh, the evolution of our lives, I think we can point to uh, a set of uh, teachers or a set of, uh, of professors or guides that somehow helped us negotiate a way through. They had an unusually strong impact in how we found our way forward. Um, and I, like most people, yes, was consider myself very, very privileged to have had a series of, of great teachers along the way. Um, the, and it's also true that not everyone is a gifted teacher. There is, it's, it is a very, very specialized art form mm. to, to really effectively teach what you know to another generation. And most of the teachers we have are not so talented. Uh, they're the, all the other names that we've forgotten along the way, but but thank goodness that that we've had those few personalities, those few great sources of inspiration that point us forward. So yes, I take your point really well at that particular time, and you're also right. The town next door didn't have that. Yeah. We were just very fortunate to have had that impulse there. Um, but I once again I I would say. It was not unique to that time. Um, El Sistema, for example, mm -hmm. was another great example of, uh, of a tremendous personality and a, a tremendous talent, sending a generation of kids out into the world with, with great perspectives. And uh, we see that repeating itself in different forms in different places. I would also like to add that when, um, when I go to, the, um, to Russia, Yes, yes, of course, I uh, perform in the great cities. Um, but sometimes, uh, through the various friends and colleagues that I have, we'll perform in decidedly unglamorous parts. Um, when I tour some parts of, of China, or some parts of Canada, for example, the recent tour we took a few months ago up to the North Pole and visited the indigenous people. Mm. Uh, in, uh, indigenous tribes, communities. You discover um, uh, a, a level of listening that will take your breath away. Mm. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with um, um, economics or what is available in terms of resources. Um, the in fact, sometimes it's just opposite. If you accept that classical music is an expression of, of the purest forms of humanity that we have, and you attach a certain value to humanity, uh, which I feel, I feel we all do, as preoccupied as we are in our modern world of consumption, because primarily we just think about consuming all of the time, um, most of us will catch ourselves and, and attach a fundamental ua um, value to mm. humanity. That that is the universal part of of, of music's um, content, and playing in these these places where people hmm, don't have access to uh, regular beautiful concert halls or opera houses, um, if ever, like. Um, in Kujuak, where we just were, they had never seen a violin before. Wow. They had never seen a trumpet before. Um, sometimes the level of listening is um, astonishing. Take your breath away. Remarkable. Do we have time for one more question before we go on to? I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, this wonderful sec in in these sections of this book. One of the through lines, in addition to the autobiography and the philosophy, is a series of essays about the composers that are your particular musical heroes, even though it's interesting you wrote in the beginning of the book that when people ask you your favorite composer, it sort of strikes you as, quote, a superficial and banal question. And yet, <laughs> here it is, this, this seems to be 
in some way an answer to that superficial and banal question. And, the, and I'll just give you the list. It's Bach, Schoenberg, Beethoven, Messiaen, Bruckner, Bernstein, and Ives, which is, I have no issue with that. I mean, these are your, these are your heroes, but I mean, it's interesting to see you kind of make that list and, and choose these and not those and those and not these. And tell us about how that process was, how you arose, Arrive, arrived at um, at those uh, at that na those names, perhaps at the expense of others. Well, I should probably uh, qual qualify or explain this. Uh, okay. As as you know, uh, Joshua, your your writing is sometimes uh, subject to editing by <laughs> the editor. Okay. I did have a great chapter on Mozart, which was just <laughs> taken away. So uh, there are a few names that uh, really I would have liked to have been there, but in the interest of the length of the book, they just disappeared. Um, on the other hand, the composers that I chose were, were names that uh, constantly find their ways into my repertoire, again and again and again, uh, and have been a part of the repertoire since really I've been a, a child including Anton Bruckner. Mm. The, and these composers, for whatever reason, they come back at various phases of, of, uh, of my life, and they come back in ways that the composers offer different kinds of um, uh, perspectives than they did the last time that they were active in my, in my repertoire. So that was primarily why, why I chose them. Got it, got it. Um, all right. That was a short one, so I'm going to ask one more question. This is because I have you here, and, and, and this is a question that plagues me and has plagued me for, for years and for decades, and I'm no closer to an answer, but I ask every wise person I meet what, the quest, what, what their perspective on it is. And that is this. Why, in your view, is it the case that um, classical music and contemporary classical music is such a hard sell to educated, sophisticated audiences who, who gobble up the latest in the visual arts, in literature, in film, in theater. Why is the San Francisco uh, Museum of Modern Art the size that it is, and the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players the size that it is, with no disrespect to an organization for whom I have great fondness, but clearly there's a there's a there's some way in which um, the that 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 sophisticated educated thirst for the new in the arts is unevenly distributed among the various arts, and it feels like it's it's a tangential question or it's a connected question to the one that you grapple in with in the book, which is to say, what is the role of classical music in contemporary society? How is this in, uh, do you have any? Maybe just a couple of observations. Mm -hmm. um, for most of the literature that we considered standard repertoire, uh, at the time it was written, it was contemporary music. And uh, people came. As recently, I, I met a woman when I was studying in Paris with Messiaen, uh, who remembered, she was very, very old, but she remembered uh, the premiere of Sacre du Printemps. And she was telling me what that was like. And she said, oh yeah, Paris, that was such a great city back in those days. And I said, okay, yeah. And she said, yes, yes. On any given evening, you could hear four or five performances of new music. So as recently as um, yeah, the beginning of the 20th century, people wanted to hear what was new. And yes, soccer was a riot, it was a scandal, but it was fun. It was really great to have been there, and she was so happy to have been there. Messiaen himself uh, related with great joy that he had made a scandal with chronochromie. He said, yes, can you imagine? I was so afraid because people were so violent after the performance that I waited an extra hour before sneaking out of the Théâtre du Champs-Élysées. <laughs> and he said, they were waiting for me and they had taken off their shoes and they hit me on the head. And 
he wasn't depressed at all. He was really happy that he had made a, a, a scandal. So um, uh, the, that's one thing that we tend to forget is that when these most of the great repertoire that we refer to today, when it was written, it was brand new and it created huge uh, emotional and spontaneous uh, reactions. Even the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. Um, uh, it, it was maybe not what you would consider a great success. Um, one of the articles uh, openly lamented that the fact that, oh, our great Meister has lost his hearing, that's probably why mm. we can't make any sense out of the Ninth Symphony. It's just... Um, uh, or the uh, the premiere of uh, Bizet's Carmen, which was met with just... A, it was a flop, a complete yeah. flop. So par part of it is... Uh, was the excitement of being there. That's one, maybe, observation. A second observation is um, uh, most of what is being created or written at any given moment in history is not very good. <laughs> what we remember right. is, are those works through consensus, consensus of the public, of critics, of performers, that over time, well, this particular piece is maintaining its relevance, so it's actually not tied to fashion. It's not time to, tied to a certain period or an era. It's above time. It's become a masterpiece. And that takes a long time uh, before a work enters into that repertoire. Uh, everything else is pretty much forgotten, uh, and usually for good reason, and that includes our own time today. Most of what's being written is probably not very good. <laughs> uh, you just have to accept that. And the third observation I would make is that um, um, whenever I do, usually when I do a new work or premiere, it is... Uh, very successful and sold out. So the most recent uh, great commission that I did was the opening of the Elf Philharmonie, the mm -hmm. Arnu Concert Hall in, in Hamburg. And the program that I took for the opening, it's, it's our home, it's our hall, was I commissioned a new piece by Jörg Wittmann called Arche, or Ark, as in Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. And I asked Jörg to remember the great Hamburg tradition um, which is, a, for me anyway, it's a, it's a humbling tradition. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, Georg Friedrich Handel, um, uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, Telemann, these were all my predecessor, Johannes Brahms, uh, yeah. Gustav Mahler. So at the time uh, of that Handel was there, uh, he was writing these great oratorios uh, based on stories from the Old Testament. And so I asked Jörg to honor our tradition, write a new piece, but somehow makes a reference to the great Hamburg past. So he wrote Noah's Ark, Archie. And uh, it was a very, very, I, one of the things I first remarked to myself was, ooh, this is going to be expensive, <laughs> because there were not one chorus, but three choruses. There were not just a soprano and a, and a baritone, but there were there was a boy soprano and two children speakers. Um, there was a double-sized orchestra and a chamber orchestra, and I thought, God, this is really expensive. This, is how can... but on the other hand, uh, it was timed where Jörg was really hitting a, a pinnacle of of a phase of comp composition where he and I both felt that on this occasion could be something very special. And it exploded. And uh, today, still, for those of us in Hamburg, we reference that piece as one of the signatures of the opening of the Elf Philharmonie, and everyone is waiting, and next year will be the fifth anniversary of the hall. And of course, we're bring, make, Bring bringing back, back Arsh, and it's sold out immediately. Wonderful. I think what we should do always as performers is um, take what it is that we offer to our public pretty seriously. It needs to be more than, I like this piece. Mm -hmm. Or it needs to be more than, oh, this is interesting. 
our audience is, um, as always throughout all of time, they are uh, highly, highly sensitive to, um, to quality. An audience, even of children, instinctively feel when something is being, when the wool is being pulled over their eyes. I mean, you could just feel if something has integrity or, or quality or not. And above and beyond that, not only taking the time to really carefully study whether or not a work has compositional integrity, but then to be truly honest and say, I like, I like this piece, I love this piece, and to be able to explain why. If you can't convince an orchestra of your colleagues to fully engage with the performance, the piece doesn't have a chance. Yeah. How is the public supposed to positively react to a piece if the colleagues aren't inspired? And how are the colleagues not to be inspired if you yourself are not inspired? And somehow if those basic subjective and objective uh, phenomenon all say green light, it's a much better chance that the public is going to embrace the work because so many people um, who believe in the piece, are sharing it with their hearts. I think that's why it's, it's a bit difficult uh, sometimes because um, you have to say no to so many people that normally you would like to say yes, and that can be tried not to be offensive, but it is offensive. I think it's, it, um, yeah, you sometimes don't end up very popular. <laughs> but well, that's, that's the, the price of fame and the price of maestrohood. Um, so speaking of the public, I think it's time to open the question, the question, the floor to questions. Um, and Ricardo has a microphone and, oh, there's microphones here. Let's start right here and, yeah. Long time no see. Hi. Vraiment, uh, je vais pas lire anglais. Um, so we've talked extensively about the first part of your talk, which is uh, how do we program? What is responsible programming? What is good music versus bad music? Um, in this country, we have the productions we do. I mean, you've worked with people like Romeo Castellucci, people who do push boundaries and do meaningful theater. And I feel like there's an attempt in this country to have theater with some meaning and a lot of theater with no meaning, but very little theater with a lot of meaning, uh, which is the inverse of what's going on in many, many fantastic opera houses in Europe, Germany in particular. What do you think is the pathway forward away from Otto Schenk productions in the US and the stuff that's easy to market? Otto well, Schenk slam. I was uh, just because Otto's a very good friend of mine. So, uh, <laughs> listen, I grew up on Otto Schenk. I just think there's other stuff out there too. Of course, it's it's uh, if it were an easy question to answer, everyone would do it. So it's not a very easy question. Uh, you must accept the fact that what is. Uh, pertinent within the context of Hamburg or Berlin or Munich is not automatically pertinent to a life experience or a societal experience um, in Quebec or New York or San Francisco. It's, uh, it's you, that has to be accepted. Um, it's not to say that the repertoire itself uh, doesn't have meaning if it's presented in the right, right way as, as Josh and I have discussed. Um, but its interpretation uh, draws upon uh, certain givens in, in the societal structure. On some level, uh, the performance of the classical arts uh, or classical art forms partly is a, a memory culture. It refers back to heritage. It refers back to ancestors. It refers back to um, history, older history. Uh, why? It's because we derive our own self-identities through the history. 
I myself consider myself a San Franciscan because I've lived here, I was born in Alta Bates and basically lived here my entire life. And so part of how I define myself as the Pacific Ocean, the Golden Gate Bridge, and those wonderful uh, events that helped define San Francisco history. So uh, that is different from what defined Las Vegas. And and it's uh, and it's brilliant uh, uh, development, and that's different from um, what defines um, Montreal. Very very different. I guess uh, one of the most important things is just to just to assume that just because something doesn't work in one particular stage is going to automatically be transferable and un understood. It's just. Um, I guess a little bit of sensitivity. Sometimes the answer is yes. Very oftentimes the answer is no. But if it's no, if the uh, collaborator is living, as with uh, Romeo Castellucci, um, you can actually pick up the telephone and say, "Hey, let's let's um, adapt this." Um, with uh, performers or composers who have passed away, it's more difficult to pick up the telephone and, and uh, ask if you can change it. But with living interpreters, that is always an option, which is just to be sensitive. Right here. Right here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you for coming back to San Francisco. Um, since you've been a leader of ensembles for uh, many, many years and have been in touch with uh, new composers. I just wanted to find out your feeling. Are there a couple composers or maybe specific pieces that you think that the general public has not cottoned on to or has heard and rejected that you think they're misguided and that you would like to put forward in particular? Um. You know, I'm I'm just a musician, just a conductor, so I I can't I don't want to take a position of off offering lofty um, insights. I I can say that um, at different times, and we all have access to um, a shifting or or a different uh, set of parameters. That's why on my piano uh, and on my desk sit a big stack of scores that uh, they are regarded as great masterpieces, great, great literature. Um, and I somehow don't get it yet. So I will, from my desk or from the piano, I'll actually from time to time just sort of sit down and open up one of these scores and look at it. And surprisingly, Sometimes a score will suddenly make sense after not making any sense for uh, for decades. I somehow finally get it. Uh, that was, for example, what happened with Wagner. As a composition student, student uh, studied Wagner, of course, and it took me a long, long time before I could open up Siegfried and uh, completely immerse myself um, into it. So. I guess one leaves room for the fact that you hope that as you get older, your perspectives widen and you can, uh, there's more of a place or a right timing to have access to literature that might not be there. But one of the pieces, uh, to come directly to your point, which at the moment I'm uh, kind of um, pushing very, very hard, is a piece that I heard performed here for the first time by Ligeti, Yorgi Ligeti, called San Francisco Polyphony. And at the time I was a, I was a composition student and boy, that was a, a very stimulating listen, but I really didn't uh, fully grasp what was going on. And that score sat on my desk for many, many years. Uh, I returned to the score uh, 10 years ago and uh, went through a series of performances and really admired the piece uh, very much and then it went back on my piano and a year ago I looked at the score and somehow it was in bright loud living color and I thought now maybe is a time I've have 
whatever the the right um, uh, approach to the work, or I am I, I'm able to access certain certain sources of insights that maybe maybe um, uh, it's a moment to reintroduce San Francisco polyphony to a much broader audience. Oh, it's, so. a, it's a completely underappreciated piece, as far as I can tell. I mean, yeah. really in, in his catalog, it doesn't get a lot of love. So It, it doesn't get a lot of love, but uh, at the moment, I'm sort of on a crusade uh, good, to... Uh, good. So maybe that's one, one piece that uh, I've... Uh, uh, if you hear me perform uh, here that I'm performing, please please come and give give the piece a chance. <laughs> here. Thank you. I'm a composition student, and I would like to know uh, how you got from playing piano to conducting, and how you work with an orchestra. Um, Could you repeat the uh, the question was, um, how did I get from playing the piano and being a composition student to working uh, as, a, as a professional conductor? I think that was the question, right? Um, on one level, I guess I've been conducting as long as I can think, uh, because with this professor whom I was speaking of, uh, Cory Shelley, he was also our church choir director, and um, he led the, the children's choir, which uh, I was a member of when I was five, and because um, later on, uh, 10, 11, because I could play the piano, uh, I oftentimes would be assigned to conduct the, the younger kids and teach them the music. So, in a way, through the church structure, conducting was uh, unveiled as a very unglamorous um, task. It was simply meant to keep time and actually help everyone stay together, which maybe in hindsight is a pretty good basis for conducting, keep everyone together. <laughs> but I'd never really thought seriously about uh, becoming a, a conductor as a profession, and it came to a head when I, when I was a composition student uh, um, at San Francisco State University. I had a, a pair of very, very influential uh, teachers, Henry Onderdonk and Grosvenor Cooper, really brilliant teachers, great, great and inspired uh, composers. And uh, part of the dream of every composition student is to actually hear their piece be performed. And uh, I was able to convince my, my poor classmates to be guinea pigs, and I would conduct them, and they would play my pieces, and um, they would offer generously their criticism of, of my pieces. <laughs> and my uh, fellow composition students were going, hey, well, yeah, do you mind doing that for my piece? And so, um, gradually, I was conducting all of the time, and it was primarily the, the repertoire of my classmates and myself, and then the teachers saying, well, gee, you know, <laughs> would you mind conducting my piece on one of these performances? And uh, so I started doing that, and then it spread outside of the school. Um, and um, slowly and, and gradually, um, I was just conducting a lot, and so um, people started calling me a conductor. And that's kind of how it happened. It was, um, it was very unglamorous. <laughs> uh, are, there any, are there any women uh, composers, significant women composers, and also what's the difference between a symphonic orchestra and a philharmonic orchestra? Uh, are there any women composers? That, so that's an easy answer, yes. <laughs> yes. And there are, even moreover, there are active today uh, brilliant visionary composers who happen to be women. Um, it's um, just, just to name a couple, Helen Grimes, who is emerging on the scene, a brilliant composer, English woman, um, Kaya Sariaho from Finland, uh, brilliant uh, master composer now, uh, Unsuk Chin from Korea, one of, one of uh, the most visionary uh, and 
sound-oriented uh, composers. Th these are just a few names uh, of, of very, very active and I would say uh, composers who have taken a leadership role for their generations and they, hap and they happen to be women. Um, the difference between a symphony and a philharmonic mostly has to do with, uh, with the roots of, of where the names come from. Um, philharmonic means to, to love. Uh, primarily oriented to sound, but really to love harmony, to love togetherness. So f that's what philharmonic means from its Greek roots. And it's a, basically a group of people who come together to share this love of uh, doing something together. In, the ca in this case, it's sounding together. Symphony, its roots come from um, uh, sounding at the same time, which of course is what, what a symphony is. Many, many elements sounding together, together at the same time. The original meaning of the Philharmonic and the symphony perhaps had to do with size. A symphony um, can be uh, something like in the case of um, Gabrielli. Uh, a sinfonia can be a group of, a very small group of, of brass players that play together. Um, a sinfonia can be, uh, uh, we call them the inventions, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, Sinfonia, um, uh, inventions sounding together. Uh, a symphony can be a Haydn orchestra, it can be a um, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach Rococo orchestra, or it can be a Beethoven orchestra. Uh, Philharmonic is uh, oftentimes, we would assume that that's a fuller sized ensemble of, of quite a bit of um, uh, representation within the winds and the brass and percussion section, so um, uh, larger forces. This philharmonic um, ensembles, I, as far as I know, nothing has been written for solo piano called philharmonic, or nothing has been written uh, during the Rococo or Baroque period called uh, philharmonic, but symphony has been with us for a long time. Philharmonic is perhaps a bit more modern, even though it traces its roots back to uh, to Greek antiquity. I'm not sure if that made any sense. Or <laughs> it, it sounded good. I want to just uh, let me just add something about about uh, women composers. Um, at the end of the year, it always falls to me to sort of look back on the calendar year and say, well, here are the 10 best or the 15 best music events of the year. And I did that recently for 2019. And what I found somewhat but not completely to my surprise, was that almost all of the most exciting and most interesting and most satisfying musical events of this past year in the Bay Area that I had covered had been performances of music by women, starting in January with a piece by Anna Torvald's daughter, and, and, and until very recently, uh, a music festival by the Polish, of music by the Polish composer Gretzina uh, Basevich, and, and various, um, events in between of living com women, women from the 19th century, from the earliest 20th century. There's an enormous repertoire of music by women that is underserved and underrepresented and is now uh, finally at last coming to the fore in addition to the women that uh, um, Kent just mentioned. So um, let's all keep our ears out for those. And I'm getting the... <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I think that's, that's are, are, are you giving us the cutoff yes, sign here? Yes. Or, yes. Let's, Stop let's talking give him a now. big hand, please. Okay. Well, thank you so Ken much. Ken and Joshua Kostman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Josh, um, may I just add one? Yeah. Uh, one point. Um, you, no one asked me why it's called Expect the Unexpected. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. No, and uh, it has to do with music education, and it has to do with this nearly utopian description that you had spoken about. And it's also meant to be a, a trigger word for uh, 
an entire uh, um, well, not an entire. Maybe how long has it been since ni- since Proposition Thirteen? Mm. Is that uh, was that 1979 or something like that? Uh, forty years, fifty years, uh, forty years, I guess. Um, so since uh, Proposition Thirteen, as we some of you remember, uh, mu- uh, music education within the school system took a very very nasty hit. And in many school systems, it just disappeared. What does that mean? That means that we have, well, at least two generations, maybe two and a half generations of of adults for whom Mozart has no meaning. It's not even a question of whether you like or don't like Mozart. It's that it has no meaning. It uh, or the famous story that I like to give my daughter. My daughter is here. Is um, uh, when when uh, she mentioned that she was going to be uh, going to uh, t- uh, to a lesson and was going out the door. And her roommate said, "Oh, what do you ha- what do you have?" And uh, Karen said, "Oh, I have Beethoven one." And her roommate said, "Well." Actually, I prefer Beethoven three. And another roommate said, "I like Beethoven three too. Beethoven two is pretty good." And uh, my daughter was really surprised because these are not musicians. And uh, she said, "Well, gee, I didn't realize you appreciated Beethoven." Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're the best. They're the best. And after extended uh, discussion, it it came to the. It came to the reality that we're, they were talking about a series of films about a Saint Bernard dog <laughs> whose name was Beethoven, and uh, he was so successful that Hollywood did a series. So, so they were referring to the third installment or the second installment. Uh, these uh, uh, and two generations for whom Beethoven has zero meaning, um, and it the, it was meant to show that actually uh, classical music, why we teach it, is not necessarily, in fact usually it's not, uh, because we would like to develop the next Alfred Brendel, or Yasha Heifetz, or whomever, um, Joshua Bell. Uh, We teach music because primarily for two reasons. one with the belief that through having a cultivated education makes our lives richer Uh, and the other reason is that through classical music we become aware of um, uh, a certain level of of abstract thinking to be able to think in the future the present and the past at the same time problem solving if you play in an orchestra you resolve social issues too it's not very nice to say you're flat you know you're you're early and you, you learn actually basic social skills uh, <laughs> play, <laughs> playing in in an orchestra um, there is respect for uh, Authority. There's um, uh, a respect for societal tensions. There are a number of reasons why we we teach uh, um, uh, classical music. But what comes from those who do study, and that's why um, some of these interviews were here. And I'm not sure if he's here, but one of one of the uh, uh, people who gave an interview was Dr. Daniel Levitin, one of the great and leading neurologists in the world. Uh, Levinton has done enormous research on what happens to a child's brain as it develops uh, uh, and what classical music does in terms of uh, affecting that development, is that there is a general observation that it allows a child to achieve a certain potential that in many cases was not even expected. Um, I think for many, many uh, people who study music, they're equally surprised that something was possible when it was not possible. That's from where the title comes, Expect the Unexpected. Exposure to, uh, to great repertoire, art music, it is essentially a counterweight to everything that is temporary. So that means fashion, 
mode, consumption. These are all temporary things. They, they disappear as uh, over time. Uh, if you buy an iPhone, or it usually becomes out of date within a finite period of time. It becomes irrelevant. As a, as a counterweight in a, in a very, very fast-moving uh, society that we live today, uh, something that is eternal uh, offers us the wonderful ability to be able to actively expect the unexpected. That's why I attach the title to this book. Okay. <laughs>